Hello, my name is David Friedland and I'm with Texas Instruments. Welcome back to the online SysBIOS training workshop. In this portion, we will be discussing two different SysBIOS modules, timer and clock. Actually, there are three different BIOS modules that concern themselves with timing services. The timer module manages the actual hardware timer peripheral on the device running the application. By going through the BIOS module rather than taking direct control of the timer hardware, a developer can manage the timer in an easier and more intuitive way, and also in a way that will be portable when porting to a different TI device. The clock module usually layers on top of the timer module and provides additional functionality including providing BIOS with a basic time base and also allowing a way for functions to be fired off in a periodic way. The third module is timestamp and I'm actually not going to be discussing this in any detail but I wanted you to be aware of it because it can provide a very powerful way to do benchmarks on your code as well as help with debugging using the real-time analysis tools. As I already mentioned the timer module works by taking control of one of the device's timer peripherals. It plugs the peripherals interrupts with its own ISR and provides a service where it can fire off one of your application's functions and it can do that as either a one-shot or periodically. That can be valuable in itself, but even more features are offered by the clock module. This module can either take as an input some external periodic event in the system that calls the clock do tick API, or more commonly is configured to use a periodic heartbeat from the SysBIOS timer module. The clock module creates a software interrupt which gets posted by one of these inputs and provides a way in which any number of different functions can be configured to fire off, either as one shots or periodically. In this way, SysBIOS makes it appear to the application that it has an almost unlimited number of timers at its disposal. Okay, so we talked about how an application can create a number of clock instances that each fire off at different rates to call their assigned function. A clock instance is characterized by two time periods. The first is called the timeout and defines the amount of time between when the instance is started and when the function is fired off for the first time. What actually starts the clock instance in the first place can be an explicit call to clock start from the application, or if the instance was created with start flag set to true, it will simply start immediately after being created. The second period that characterizes the clock instance is the period, which defines how much time elapses between the first function call and all the calls after that. For a one-shot clock, only the timeout value is defined, and the period will simply be set to zero. Keep in mind that the functions called by each of the clock instances are being invoked in the context of the clock's software interrupt. What this means is that any calls to clock start and clock stop must be called from that same context and not from any other independent threads that happen to be executing. Other API calls include clock tick start and clock tick stop to allow controls of the underlying timer that is driving the clock module, and clock set period, clock set timeout, clock set func to modify a clock's instance parameters. There is also an API called clock tick reconfig, which allows the clock params to be reconfigured if the CPU frequency changes because of any frequency scaling going on. A clock instance can be created at configuration time or at runtime. Right now I'm going to talk about how to create a clock instance during runtime. If you look at the code snippet here, I am using several different variables. The first two are types defined by the clock module to hold all of the various clock instances parameters and to store the handle of the clock instance that we will create. By calling clock params init, we can fill the param structure with all of the default parameter values and then update the individual parameters that need to have different values than the default. In this case, 
I am explicitly setting up the clock instance period parameter to 4 and the start flag parameter to true. We are also setting up an error block variable so that if the create failed, we could find out more information on why it failed. Finally, we call clock create, which will instantiate the clock instance and return back the handle to that instance. Also on this slide is a summary of the other API calls used to control a clock instance. To configure the clock module statically, you can use the SysBIOS configuration tool xgconf and select the clock module. Here you can see that the tick source is selectable and can be configured to use the timer input or an external system input to act as the clock heartbeat. You can also select a source of null, but that's an optimization that will prevent any clock function from firing and as a matter of fact will prevent any SysBIOS API calls to have a timeout. For example, a semaphore pend call cannot have a timeout value in that case. The timer ID is used to specify which of the chip's physical timers are actually utilized. A value of minus one here will allow the config tool to select the default timer. I mentioned before that the clock module is implemented as a software interrupt that is posted by the underlying timer module, so the priority of that software interrupt is settable. And finally, the tick period specifies the period between the system ticks. Once the clock module is configured, you can create clock object instances to periodically fire off individual functions. The actual function in your application that will be invoked is specified in the clock FXN field. The initial period between when the clock starts running and the function first fires is specified by the timeout value. The start flag will determine if the clock starts immediately when the BIOS scheduler starts to run or if the application will need to make a specific call to the clock start API to kick things off. Once the function is invoked for the first time, the period will determine when it will be invoked a second time and all the times after that. Making this value zero is how you turn this clock instance from a periodic firing function to a one-shot. There is also an arg function so that you can specify a static value to be passed to the function that is invoked. One reason you might want to do this is so you can have a single function that is used for multiple clock instances. Since each instance can pass a different value to the invoked function, you can implement the function to know which clock invoked it and then take the appropriate action. Thanks for listening to this portion of the SysBIOS online training. I hope it proved helpful. Please note that SysBIOS is included as a component to CoComposer Studio. However, if you would like to download SysBIOS as a standalone product, you can go to the webpage listed here. Also, if you have any questions about using SysBIOS, or if you would like to make suggestions on how to improve this training series, please post a comment to the TI E2E Forums BIOS page at the web address shown here. There are some very knowledgeable developers and users of SysBIOS who might be able to help you out. Good luck with your upcoming software development.